This is TREP Wire Week in Review for week ending June 19th. I'm Martha Kocher with TREP, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS commercial real estate and CLM markets. Each week, our experts, Manis Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Joe McBride, Head of Siri Finance, join us. Today, we have another one of our experts, Andrew Jacobs, Head of Structured Finance. Andrew manages the CMBS and CLO products and has been in the trenches as a CLO portfolio manager as well as a product manager bringing analytics tools to market. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you. It's going to be fun. This week, economic data show that the nation is coming back in some key pockets. Jobless claims ticked downward to 1.5 million initial claims. Retail spending has surged, and manufacturers are showing signs of improvement. The central bank earlier this week said it would start buying corporate bonds to help further boost the economy. And ever the voice of caution, Jay Powell told Congress that the nation is at a critical juncture in its recovery as continued concerns about the virus initially weighed on Wall Street gains. Our team, as always, is here to help put the news in context. So let's get started with some of the macro news. Well, it's been an interesting week. It's been an interesting month, uh, I guess you would say. What I find with every announcement that comes out is the numbers are incredibly dismal yet somehow they're not as dismal as what people were expecting, right? That you see, you know, a negative 45 GDP from the Atlanta Fed, yet there were some analysts out there that said it could have been negative 50, right? So uh, for a lot of this data that came out, um, the market rallied off of it. And, and it's kind of remarkable, to be honest. But people who are, you know, betting on that V-shaped recovery are really counting on the comeback of all time, really, for this. It's, uh, you know, I was watching Hoosiers last night, 90-year-old Gene Hackman out there, you know, uh, trying to get He's his guys. He's 90 now. He wasn't 90 in Hoosiers. No, he wasn't 90 in Hoosiers. <laughs> he was 90 now. You know, he's out there telling them to run the picket fence and everything else. They have a nice comeback. And that was quaint and it was, you know, a great sports movie. But this is 100 times more um, – Unlikely. Exciting, unlikely. <laughs> if, if we see the kind of comeback that we see that we saw in Hoosiers over those last four minutes, you know, it's just, uh, it's hard to imagine. Well, I just want to point out that I find the Fed to be in this GDP now number to be alarmist because they don't really explain to you that this is an annualized number. 45% drop in GDP in the second quarter. Holy moly. No, no, no. It's 45% annualized. So it's more like 11% drop in the second quarter. We don't expect 45% drop for the whole year. We're assuming there's going to be some recovery here. I, on the other hand, am very disappointed that Hertz suspended their stock offering. Uh, I was very much planning on buying some equity that was worth $0, uh, hoping for it to you know, balloon on the greater fool theory. But I guess the SEC felt like they had to step in on that one. Buy the car. Leave the stock. I'll channel the, uh, the Godfather. Take the car, there. leave the stock. That's right. Especially now that there's a glut of cars out there. I actually looked online. I actually looked on their website um, after we mentioned that a couple podcasts ago and was looking at some, uh, some SUVs, but they don't have the, the greatest of deals. I would Not figure yet. they'd be selling them at, you know, 70% of Kelly Blue Book, but they're right on, they're right on there. You were hoping it was going to be like oil, where they'd give you 40 bucks to take the oil off your hands. Right. I'll take this Chevy Tahoe and $100 to do you a solid. But I'll pay for the insurance and I'll make sure it gets parked every night. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Should we turn to the CMBS numbers? Um, the June numbers are almost complete. We're at about 90% of the counties having reported. Still waiting on Broward County, as they like to say on election night when Florida is still up in the air. Uh, the numbers were ugly. Um, 30 plus days delinquent in retail went from 10% in May to 19% in June. Um, when we had about a third of the remittance reports in a few days ago, we thought that number was going to be like 17%. So it got even worse um, once we saw the numbers of remittances grow 19%. Um, in lodging, it went up from 19% in May to 24% in June. Overall, if the month were to end right now, it would be 10.65%, which would be an all-time high for the CMBS market. If you're looking for green shoots, there are some. 
Um, multifamily and office only saw very marginal increases in the delinquency rate. Um, industrial actually went down. So there uh, are some pockets of strength there, which is encouraging. Uh, I feel a little bit like Andrew Cuomo right now, kind of reading the the growth in testing numbers and the number of ventilators and hospitalizations. Um, but there are some other green shoots. Uh, the percentage in grace period as of June for retail, 5.1% down from 12% last month. So if you're projecting those to become delinquent in July, there's only 5% more to run, if you will. You know, to take another Cuomo line, we got the virus on the run. We're almost... We've always stamped this bad boy out. Uh, lodging, 7.5% still in grace period, down from 14% last month. Uh, overall, 4% in grace period as of June, 7.6% uh, in May. So there was an improvement. It seems like we're starting to reach terminal uh, velocity in terms of the number of loans that are going to become delinquent. Um, we could see an uptick later in the year for office and multifamily as leases expire and other things change. Um, but I think that some of the mega jumps in delinquency numbers that we've seen over the last two or three months should start to level out over the next 60 to 90 days, uh, which would be a great thing to see. Yeah, so we're, we're eagerly watching uh, the last few days worth of heavy roll days of remittance to see if we will surpass that historical number. I think we're probably on pace to just surpass it slightly. Um, hopefully it's, uh, like last time where that is the top and we can start improving and hopefully we can improve by leaps and bounds, uh, as these forbearances or, you know, as people just get back to, to work and life and, and stores and hotels, maybe someday, hopefully. But going back to the GDP number, Joe, when you talked about the 45% annualized, um, number really being kind of like a 10 to 14 or 10 to 12%. When you think about that though, when the Fed came out with their Dodd-Frank numbers and they wanted people to run a severely adverse case, we were talking about a negative 6% GDP at the worst. For those that don't know this, we run every bank in the US through a stress test every quarter and we come up with um, banks capital ratios, anticipated capital ratios through a downturn. And now you have to throw away that playbook, right? Everything that everybody thought would be a severely down, adverse downturn is now out the window. And that also goes for Cecil as well, where you have numbers where people thought a downward cycle would represent X, and now we're talking about two or three X. So uh, a lot will change in terms of loss allocations and reserve ratios, and it will be an interesting time for banks and REITs and others. Yeah, well, you know, for, for those non-nerds uh, out there, Cecil is a new accounting standard where you have to forecast expected losses on all your loans. Uh, I think we had an actual, a really good guest blog um, from Abrigo uh, this week about how COVID could potentially affect banks' reserves. Uh, but I do know that, you know, having lived through all this stress testing stuff over the last few years, the severely adverse case that the Fed would force banks to run through their stress testing was often called like the break the bank, end of the world, never really actually going to happen scenario. And now the severely adverse case seems like what's actually happening right now. Uh, and actually what's happening right now could potentially be worse other than on the unemployment side, it's worse, but we, we just don't know what the CRE price side is because there's not enough transactions happening. Uh, and there's enough kind of fed liquidity and foreclosure moratoriums and forbearances and stuff like that. Basically get out of jail free cards uh, happening right now. So we don't know exactly how it's going to affect the value of some of these assets. Going back uh, to CMBS, TRIP also is continuing its spotlight on CMBX with CMBX 13. Manis, give us an idea of what we're going to be looking for there. Well, we focused on some of the reasons one might want to short some of the CMBX series in um, CMBX 12, we talked about how it had the biggest exposure to offices of all the CMBX series. And we said, if shorting your offices is your thing, this is a series to look at. Um, we also talked last week about CMBX 7, which has the most um, exposure to retail plus hotel 
um, plus multifamily of all the series. So if you were looking to get into a short that was um, a much lower carry, hundreds of basis points lower in carry than CMBX six, triple B minus, then CMBX seven might be somewhere to set your sights. This week we focus more on the positive. Uh, CMBX 13, the newest series, it has the least exposure to retail loans, uh, the least exposure to the sum of retail and lodging at 32%. It does have high office exposure, 31.4%. Uh, and it does have the tightest cost of protection for triple B minus. So it's uh, lower risk, lower reward. Um, if you think that retail and ho hotel are the big areas of risk. And so we highlight that in this week's blog as um, something for investors to consider if they are thinking of taking a long or a short position in CMBX as a way of making a bet on CRE. Looking at commercial real estate, you mentioned uh, lodging and retail. Those are two sectors we've been watching and reporting on closely since the shutdown. And we've seen a number of stories coming, coming out this week. Uh, give us an idea of some of the things that we saw this week. Well, we did see several hotel stories come out some good, some bad. Um, let's start with a positive. We saw a big hotel down in Florida granted relief. Uh, the reef came, relief came in the form of using the FF&E reserves to keep the loan current, which made the loan current as of June, uh, helps keep a lid on the, uh, it was the Lowe's by the way, in Miami Beach, $240 million loan. Um, but interestingly in the remittance report, they disclosed how much FF&E reserve they had, which was extraordinarily high, almost $40 million, um, and what the burn rate would be. And that burn rate was such that even at the end of September, at the current burn rate, there would still be 28 or $30 million left in that reserve. So it gave CMBS investors a, um, a sense of how much protection they had in terms of keeping the loan current and how long that might um, continue on. Uh, actually, I think I'm confusing two loans. I'll have to go back to Tripwire, but one was a single asset, Miami Beach Hotel, and one was a portfolio. But in any event, it was um, a very transparent uh, forbearance in this particular case. Uh, and it's right in line with what Tammy and David from the Henley Group were telling us, right? Using, not necessarily forbearing payments, but just allowing you to tap some reserves and then replenish them at the end of the period. So uh, good that they have all those reserves there to use, but uh, probably not as uh, lenient of a forbearance agreement as we maybe initially thought would be happening, you know, 90 days ago. As an aside, I have my windows open today because the weather here in New York is great. And, and I know later we're gonna talk about migration patterns outside of uh, people moving from the city to the suburbs, but I'm not sure if you could tell that it seems like Hell's Angels has decided to move from San Francisco to Westchester County. I thought it was. Uh, a, I and thought just it was drove my bus by my window <laughs> here. Um, on the negative side of the reporting stuff, we did see a single asset uh, deal where the borrower said that they wanted to begin the process of handing the property back. Um, Modification discussions had ended. They were seeking to um, have a receiver set up to receive the properties after no agreement could be reached. Uh, it's a 2017 SASB deal, 48 limited service hotels in 21 states. Um, that was reported on Wednesday afternoon in a trading alert by us. Um, it'll be repeated on Friday morning. And then also on, on Thursday afternoon, we got evidence at uh, the owner of a Houston hotel, $36 million hotel near the Houston Galleria, wanted to toss back the keys as well. This was backing a 2015 loan. So um, I think even though we talked about the positives and maybe delinquencies leveling off, um, I think we will see more of this where um, marginal properties, things that were marginal heading into the COVID crisis in terms of debt service coverage ratio, occupancy, rev par, uh, you start to see borrowers throw in the towel and start the process of giving the keys back. 
Yeah, looking at that single asset deal that you talked about, you said SASB, that's single asset, single borrower. Um, you know, historically, those types of uh, CMBS deals have taken almost 0% losses, you know, going back in time. I think I can remember, I think there's maybe one or two that have taken some losses ever. So, you know, if this does turn into a, a loss, it's going to be kind of a new thing, right? Usually these types of deals are underwritten to very large institutional sponsors, to very large uh, class A type properties, or to very large portfolios where there's enough diversification that, you know, usually you don't see losses. And this one in particular had nearly 2.0 debt service coverage ratio, you know, fairly high occupancy for lodging property in 2019. So it just goes to show you how, how hard this thing is hitting hotels. You know, just as an aside, and we put this out in our trading alert for our listeners, these things tend to be very fluid and, you know, uh, changes of heart do take place. And just because the borrower has uh, indicated this, uh, it doesn't mean that at some point there will be a change of heart and a modification will be worked out uh, or some kind of relief granted or some kind of accommodation. So um, it is not uh, necessarily the end of the story at this point. Especially if we can pull off that road trip that we were talking about. I mean, I, I have the list of properties right here, California, Virginia, Massachusetts, Michigan, North Carolina. I think we could probably hit them all in a, in a month or two. I don't know if our one or two room revenue will help them stay afloat. Probably as, not. Long as, as long as I could play the music. <laughs> we'll give you the aux chord, Manus. <laughs> Looking at retail, we saw a number of malls miss uh, more payments and owners miss payments. So obviously that keeps uh, mounting losses for these sectors. Give us some background on that. Well, we did see a great retail number uh, macroeconomically, right? I think we, we skipped past that earlier. Retail sales jumped almost 18%. Uh, in May after dropping 14 or 15% uh, in April. So, you know, there's definitely, I think we talked about it last time, the tale of two economies right now. There's the New York City, California, DC uh, lockdown states. And then there's the Florida, South Carolina, Texas, you know, Southern states that have reopened. And uh, apparently the reopening, I mean, when you look at the retail sales graph, it does happen to look like a V. I'm just saying. I'm not saying I'm a V-shaped guy, but I'm just saying that this particular chart was a V-shape this month. So I don't think that's going to help malls, unfortunately. But uh, just in general, you know, economically, I think that's that's a very good sign. Yeah, just da I think data showed on the uh, digital sales just today um, that there were significant numbers moving to online sales, and some in some cases people who had never bought anything online before were now using digital channels to make purchases. It's the grandma, exactly. it's the grandma effect. There'll be no and summer of love for shopping malls in the U S unless they, they follow Keegan's uh, suggestion and start making them drive in movies. I, don't, I mean, I, I do think that there's a lot of people who um, in the, particularly in the older segments who kind of stepped away from shopping uh, during this crisis and they, they, they haven't really been uh, getting into online shopping as much. Um, I know my, my mother uh, was jumping for joy when Bloomingdale's announced that they're reopening their store. Um, you know, and uh, she, she, every time uh, she's over and she sees that uh, we ordered groceries online, she looks at us like we're crazy. So, um, you know, there, there may be is, uh, some, some rebound, you know, for, for retail in the future, you know, like Joe's hoping for, but we'll see. Guys like me remember that these stores used to have restaurants in them at one time. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's time to bring back the restaurant within the uh, within the you, store itself yeah, to start. I mean, you uh, get like a you know a malt shake, right at the little uh, the little stand up bar. Is that what you you're know, talking you'd about? You get like a, a grilled cheese with a pickle and maybe some coleslaw and a nice shake. Uh, well, that's where you go to Costco now. You go to Costco and they got you know the six foot long hot dog and the you know giant slice of pizza. For about 6,000 calories uh, for a dollar. And somehow only, it's good. I only want the six foot long hot dog if there's a six foot long bun. 
<laughs> I hate when there's a, a bun hot dog mismatch. It just it sets me off. Yeah. Poor arbitrage. I, I did see that <laughs> this uh, in, in retail and lodging is an, another area that actually there's there's a lot of overlap or, or some overlap anyway between uh, commercial real estate and, and corporate CLOs. Um, you know, so a couple other stories involved Hilton uh, laying off a bunch of employees uh, as well as 24 hour fitness closing 130 stores. Uh, both of those are uh, pretty heavily featured in corporate CLOs, or at least they were in the past. Each of those with greater than 300 million of, of exposure across the space. Uh, but they are, they, they're actually uh, kind of seem to be diverging in their, in their outcome with, um, with Hilton, uh, it dropped to the low 80s after coronavirus started in terms of a loan price. Uh, but now it's back up to almost par and, uh, and a lot of the managers were buying on the dip there. And meanwhile, 24 hour fitness is, uh, is, in, the, is in the high 20s at this point. Um, so not, not a great story there. It's, it's one of the first things I do as somebody who likes to straddle both the CMBS and CLO sides that when I see one of these chapter 11 bankruptcies or uh, strategic advisors being brought in, the first thing I do is I look where their corporate headquarters is located and see if that backs a, a CMBS loan. It's a, uh, you know, one of those things where there's more overlap than you would think at times. Yeah. And you can kind of go in reverse too, right? It's if it's not chapter 11, you can see what, what credits are dropping in price precipitously before there's some, you know, obvious news out there and you can kind of back into, oh, there must be something going on here. Uh, and then you can kind of bring it over to the CMBS side as well. Right. Right. In, in my, uh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Ian. Yeah, I was just going to say in the, in a, in a past life when I was investing in, in, um, in CLOs, uh, you know, the, during uh, some of the hurricanes, uh, you know, risk management would come and say, hey, you know, what's, what's the impact of this hurricane? Um, for, our, for our CMBS holdings, a pretty, pretty straightforward exercise, uh, a lot of work, but a straightforward exercise. Uh, for CLOs, my answer would be, you know, hell if I know. Um, the, you know, <laughs> the, uh, to, maybe, maybe I could look up where their headquarters is, but other than that, I, I couldn't possibly tell you. Um, what do you mean a lot of work? All you got to do is log in to trep.com Go to our loans in the spotlight page, and there it is. Somebody did that I, work. I agree. <laughs> I agree. So we saw a number of stories this week uh, talking about value reductions. Maybe we could spend a minute in talking about how appraisal reductions work, Manis. Sure. Uh, two parts to that. For those that are not in the CMBS market, uh, the appraisal reduction process is a way for a servicer to take a risk off the table in terms of not having to advance as much, much P&I on a loan that is distressed. So to give a numerical example, um, this week we saw a Houston hotel, I think it had about a $40 million loan balance. Its original collateral balance was 66 million. It had been in default. Um, as long as the value was still at 66 million, the servicer was on the hook to advance 100% of the P&I on that loan while it was in default. This week, a new value came out that valued the collateral at about 22 million. So it was about $18 million underwater. Uh, and that 22 million represented a little over 50% of the balance of the loan. By the math that um, is part of the CMBS documents and the CMBS industry, the servicer now only has to advance about 50% of the loan P&I each month. So they're not on the hook to advance everything. But for CRE people that are not in the CMBS investor market, these appraisal reductions are in the absence of any kind of transactions taking place, any sales tra transactions taking place. They are an opportunity to see what a, an independent third party uh, evaluator values a property at in an illiquid market. So if people are trying to get a sense of what is a Houston um, hotel full service uh, in the Houston Galleria market looking like in terms of value per room in the COVID era, there aren't a whole lot of these but as they come up, it is a benchmark for people to look at if they want to try to assign value to similar hotels to say, okay, 
this looks like it's about X or Y per room. And if we're trying to get a sense of um, where we might place a bid on a distressed asset, this would be a, a benchmark in the absence of any real bona fide um, trading. The one caveat of this is these evaluations take place at a certain point in time and the servicer reports them at a different point of time. So sometimes you may see that, oh, this value was done in May and it was reported in June. Sometimes the valuation was done in January pre-COVID, but was not reported until June. So knowing how this works um, is very important to consider whether this is a benchmark or not. And perhaps maybe Martha, this is an idea for a blog that we could do some of the bigger appraisal reductions down the road so people get a sense of that. And certainly our listeners can ping us with questions on this and, and we'll answer uh, via email with uh, examples for this. I think back in like 2012, we used to do that, right? We like did. every month yeah. we did the biggest ARAs or the biggest appraisal reductions every month. This is, you know, this is super inside baseball stuff we're doing today, but uh, it's, that is also one of the reasons for CMBS loans taking on the, at face value, they take higher losses in general when they do default, not because of appraisal reductions, but because of that whole servicer advancing concept. So the servicer advances principal and interest, then they actually accrue interest on those advances, right? There are additional fees and asset management fees and, and um, disposition fees as well. So uh, I know that when we were doing models um, or when we still do models, we kind of back a lot of that out when we're trying to figure out what the true kind of property economic loss was. I sense that with these last like five minutes talking about appraisal reductions, We've it's lost like the Super the Bowl audience. has just gone to a blowout, <laughs> right? The ratings have just gone from like 90% down to 32%. Remember when there was out. a blackout at halftime? Yeah. Remember that? Was that the San Francisco versus uh, Joe Flacco? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's what, that's what just happened. So we're going to bring him back. We're going to bring him back. <laughs> we, we talked to uh, CBRE's Brian Stoffers, head of the debt and structured finance practice this week, who was relatively positive about the economic outlook, if I recall. Um, this week, CVRE released a report that showed that the office market in San Francisco had a drop in demand in the last few months. So the question is, is the lure of working in a major city wearing off? Well, the uh, endless flow of venture capital money to money losing businesses has stopped. So I think that's a big part of the San Francisco story. So you don't have startup, you know. I'm going to build a new scooter sharing app and I can take 50,000 square foot of space in San Francisco because I just got $100 million to burn from a VC. That story is not happening as much right now. Um, but has the lore of working in major cities worn off? Uh, for me, it has, but uh, the, lore <laughs> was never, the lore was never there for me in the first place. But I do think that, you know, I, there was a Wall Street Journal article this week that I read and they were tracking, um, some company was tracking cell phone data and seeing how, what percentage of people moved from like uh, Kings County or Manhattan to outside of Manhattan and stayed out for more than three weeks. And same for DC and I think same for LA or San Francisco and the numbers were astronomically high compared to the same time last year. Obviously, a lot of these people are going to their mom's house and coming back to the city when this thing blows over. But when you can work from home and, you know, when the knowledge workers can, you know, work from a beautiful back porch away from the subway and away from all the craziness that happens in cities... I, you may see that, right? You may see the reversal of all of the trends that we've been talking about for the last 10 years. Well, Brian brought up a good point, which is it may not be up to the uh, millennials themselves to make this decision. You know, he talked about a spoken hub model to diversify more and to get away from having all your employees in a single location. And so this decision may be made for... Um, multifamily dwellers um, going forward. And we'll we'd be releasing that interview next week. So uh, it, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, he went from, what did he say, traveling 40 some weeks a year to 
Zoom meeting 24 seven. He also Omaha said he steaks. lost. He said he lost weight during the quarantine, which I find unbelievable. Yeah, like I, I've, well, I've, I've I put on the quarantine fifteen. Like he went off like the steak dinners. That's true. He was probably doing a lot of uh, lunches and dinners with clients, so that makes sense. But I mean, uh, that was a great interview, I thought. And um, I said in the interview the last time I saw him was in San Diego. He was interviewing Alex Rodriguez. Uh, Little did we know that A-Rod owns like 6,000 multifamily units, but uh, he had some interesting stories there. Uh, he has to be uh, optimistic, right? And I think I am too. But, you know, from a, a company that makes their money on transactions, I think, you know, they're going to do well no matter what happens, right? They can, they can pivot from investment sales to loan sales, right? From you know, appraisals because there are new transactions happening to reappraisals because banks are ordering them, you know? So I think CBRE is, is well positioned to do well, no matter what happens, but uh, it was nice to have a positive voice on the podcast for once, Manus. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we'd keep looking at some of these trends toward urban centers away. We also had a webinar uh, just uh, today actually on affordable housing. So that had some interesting insights as well about the trends uh, around different cities trying to uh, add affordable housing to their roles. So uh, we'll be putting a summary out about that. Yeah, there was, uh, you know, I don't want to bury or I don't want to give away all the goods, but Brian was mentioning an interesting anecdotal trend that he was seeing in some of these suburban um, hotels were uh, transitioning to be multifamily. Uh, and even there was the concept of turning them into kind of a uh, shared office space, not necessarily like a WeWork type of thing, but maybe more like a, you know, a Regis where you can rent one or two rooms. And I know that there are some people at TREP who are uh, going stir crazy with their four or five kids uh, ready to you know, go somewhere quiet to work. They're looking forward to coming back. I won't mention anybody by name in case well, their wives one of listen. Our, one of our loyal <laughs> listeners, whose name is Dave, right, um, is very eager to get back to the office. Um, we also saw a survey by Gartner that was published in Forbes that said that CFOs are going to be trimming real estate expenses uh, this year and next. I think some of it may be related to the work from home phenomena, but what other things are we seeing there, Joe? Yeah, so... I mean, if you think about it, uh, any CFO worth their salt is probably sitting in their office in their house and looking around and, and thinking, you know what, our team or our company is actually performing fairly well and we're not using the office, right? So I'm not going to make take this drastic step and say, I will, we're not going to go back to the office at all and we're going to cut our expenses by 100%, but there definitely must be an idea of can I reduce my office space or can I, you know, <laughs> lower some of the amenities a little bit because only a, a quarter of the workforce will be there at any one time? You know, can I uh, lower my HVAC costs because I'm not, there's going to be fewer people there heating up the place. And I know that, you know, we have a, a specific uh, trial going on with, uh, with some prospects who have lots of office space. And what they're doing is going through and looking at our commercial real estate data to find out, uh, you know, where they potentially have some leverage with their landlords, right? So I occupy 50% of an office building and knowing that there's a maturing loan coming up in a year and my lease is expiring in six months, I know that I have epic leverage with the landlord to negotiate. And I think, you know, putting that aside, there is epic leverage for any tenant right now because you can always lean back on the fact that, hey, I'm, I can't come back because your building is unsafe uh, and you're not, there's no other tenants looking to come in and, and lease new space. So you have to work to keep me. So I think that even just using that leverage to lower their, their costs is going to be something that they do. If we're still doing this in 10 years, we'll be telling the office, they're the, they're the listening audience, I should say, that there used there to be this place where that they we used to go <laughs> kickball teams and christmas parties 
you know, the, the new young people will be really. What's a party? What's a party? <laughs> right. What's kickball? What's a ball? <laughs> <laughs> Is that something you play on Xbox? <laughs> Well, let's, uh, let's turn to corporate CLOs. Uh, signs of stress. The first European CLOs are buckling under the burden of the pandemic and some insurers may be taking a hard look at their exposure. Andrew, give us some ideas around what's the takeaway. Sure. I mean, so, so on the first part, talking about there was a, a Bloomberg article, I believe, about some European uh, over collateralization test failures in CLOs. Um, it was just on a, on a handful of deals. Um, so this is more of a story of, of things going from everything's fine to slightly worse. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that I don't know if, if um, it's too surprising. So, it, you know, there's always been in the past a, uh, a feeling that the European CLO market sort of uh, 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 followed the U.S. market, uh, that whatever happened in the U.S. would kind of happen in, in Europe later. Um, so, um, you know, th so this, I think, is just following that same trend. Um, In your uh, past life, Andrew, you were uh, managing a book of CLO investments. You know, if you were in that same seat now, uh, would you be a buyer of paper or would you be, uh, you know, kind of hoarding cash? Um, well, you know... I'll answer that two ways. You know, in the, in the seat I was in at, a, at an insurance company, right, it was my job to buy CLO tranches. So I would never voluntarily uh, stop doing my job. Um, that being said, if I was a, uh, you know, if I was at a hedge fund or if I was an opportunistic investor uh, and I could put the money to work elsewhere besides uh, one asset class, um, I still think that, that uh, CLOs look good in general. And it's, it's a matter of you know, you have to get into the details. Um, it's a matter of relative value and things like that. Um, you know, one, one, of the, one of the reasons that there's been so much uh, um, activity in the CLO space over the years is that it's a floating rate asset. It performed really well. And on a yield basis, it looked better than, you know, pretty much anything else. Um, and that may not be the case anymore, you know, in general, but it's still a very, you know, good yielding asset. And, and, you have to really imagine a, a, a tremendously bad scenario to, to see losses at the senior part of the stack. When you look at the data itself, you know, which I am mining TREP data, you know, constantly, when you add up for some of these managers, the exposure to cruise lines, hotels, movie theaters, retail, oil and gas, casual dining, you know, the, the concentration of the sum of those can add up to 20 or 25 percent of, um, you know, of what they hold. Does the pandemic and that ex exposure hurt the narrative of diversification and active management as an appeal for investors, or does it kind of make it even more um, relevant than it was before the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, the, the story with CLOs, of course, is, is, is that it's highly diverse or supposed to be highly diversified where, um, any one industry can never account for more than, say, 10% uh, of, uh, of the overall deal. Um, there's explicit tests around the, 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 the correlation in the pool uh, that, the, that the deal has to abide by. Uh, but you're right that if you add up all of the problem industries together, uh, you're looking at uh, a different picture. Um, and that's why there's, uh, there's been some, uh, some worry, especially in the junior parts of the stack, um, where you're, you're much more likely to get hit. You know, a double B, you might have nine, 10% of subordination. Um, that being said, subordination in CLO works differently than subordination in other structured assets. Um, CLOs have diversion of cash flows to cure the, to cure the deal, but also they, they're actively managed um, and the manager can sell out of loans and buy new loans and they frequently do that. That's, you know, generally speaking, a CLO po pool that you invest in two years later, that pool is mostly different. Um, so, you know, the, the, uh, it's, it's tough to say exactly. I mean, I, I think that certainly at the senior parts of the capital structure, you're, you're not, you're still not really worried about losing money. you you might be worried about downgrades. Um, but you know, it's, uh, uh, you see a lot of stuff in the press where they, they show, um, charts where, you know, the subordination is eroding on the triple A's, but a lot of times they kind of. Uh, gloss over some of the facts, like, you know, one of the, one of the big things is that we, we are looking at 
senior debt. Um, the, the loans in, in CLOs are senior debt. Um, they're secured debt. And um, so it's not like 2007, 2008, when you had subordinated debt being packed into deals and the subordinated debt was underwritten with fraud. Um, in this situation, you have senior debt that, as far as anybody knows, is not, not widely uh, affected by fraud. Um, and so the recovery rates, you would hope, are not so low that uh, that the triple A's, for example, would potentially lose money. A lot of the pitches from CLO managers over time have been that they're great active managers and they're active managers as active managers, they'll help sidestep a lot of the landmines. But at times over the last couple of years in the press, you've seen stories that, you know, tons of managers just tend to hold the same credits, right? There's an awful lot of overlap from manager to manager. Yep. Do you think we're going to see a lot of new winners and losers coming out of this, guys that did it right and guys that weren't quick on the, the exit trigger? Or do you think everybody's going to see the same kind of performance because everybody was kind of uh, zeroed in on the same credits six months ago? You'll definitely see winners and losers. Um, one, of the, one of the side effects of the tremendous growth in the CLO market um, has been that you know, you CLOs are are a fee based business. Um, so it's to the generally speaking, it's to the benefit of the manager to issue more deals. Um, and a lot of managers have increased their AUM substantially. And um, as you as you mentioned, uh, that that can increase uh, correlation between deals, uh, overlap between deals. Uh, a lot of managers, a lot of the bigger managers, are sort of forced to buy uh, some loans that maybe they don't like as much, just because they need paper to put in the CLO. And um, there's, so there's more kind of not forced buying, but essentially forced buying in a way. And, uh, and then, and you also end up being more of an index where you just, you can't buy too much of any one loan. So you just kind of buy a little bit of everything. So, you know, absolutely there will be, there'll be uh, managers who get hit more than others. Um, and, and, you know, the flip side is that the smaller managers, generally speaking, are, it's harder for them to be nimble when they're doing the, the loan transactions. You know, they, they don't get the, the good allocations they don't get the first call when there's loans up for sale. Um, so there is, there are disadvantages to being a smaller manager as well. Are you tracking how much cash CLO managers have on hand and is it substantially higher than it was um, in February? Or is there a lot of dry powder at this point? We do track, uh, we do tr track cash and it, 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 uh, it varies quite. It's, it's tough to say, you know, I'd have to look at the total number, um, but it, it varies manager to manager. Generally speaking, it's, you know, managers, regardless of the environment, are, are, are avoid holding a lot of cash um, because you need, you know, it's an arbitrage structure. You want as much return out of the assets as possible. And it, it, even even a, uh, a senior investor doesn't really want the deal to be holding cash because excess, excess interest is what's used to cure the deal. Um, so a lot of managers will, will you know, be essentially fully invested at all times. In fact, through trickery around settlements and so on, you can be you can have negative cash in a CLO and that's, that's very common. Well, Joe's, Joe's nodding his head. He learned a lot in that uh, segment right there. Should we ask uh, Andrew the question we ask of everybody? VW or L? It's not uh, Volkswagen or Lexus. It's <laughs> VW or L. Yeah, I got, I got confused for a VW second. VW or Lexus? No, no. It's uh, what kind of recovery we're going to see. Um, you know, when, when the whole thing started, I was trying to pick, you know, just, just really for fun. I was trying to kind of predict the bottom of the stock market and I, I definitely predicted too low. So I will, I'll, I'll, I'll overcorrect here and say that we're going to have a nice, a nice solid V shaped recovery. I was talking to, uh, one of my nephews today and he goes to a liberal arts school in the Northeast. He was saying that when he goes back, it's going to be tent eating right? No more cafeterias, no more uh, regular silverware, regular, um, you know, china plates or anything else. It's going to be plastic spoons, plastic forks, chinette, you know, the whole thing. And I'm thinking these kids' heads are going to explode. For 18 years, they've been, you know, told that plastic is terrible and it's going to be the end of us all. <laughs> and now they're going back to their liberal arts school and that's what they're going to be fed for for you know 15 weeks it's going to be just gonna a say. real moral dilemma and uh, i don't know how they cope i thought civilization took a huge step downward when we went from the sweaty wax cup with a lot of ice 
to the plastic cup with the plastic lid, right? <laughs> the only way to drink a beer or a soda is it a sweaty wax cup with a lot of ice, no straw, Coke, no Pepsi. I do, I do agree. I, I, I maintain that Coke tastes better in a styrofoam cup. Yeah, but much better in the wax cup. You know, the kind that I've they never, do. I've never tried that. I'll have to do a, yes. a taste test. So, you know, <laughs> speaking of, uh, it makes me think of concessions. We were talking about drive-in theaters that have been popping up. And uh, one this week in our own producer, Keegan's Neck of the Woods in Brooklyn. What's the interest in piling into the car with the family to watch a classic movie? Uh, <laughs> apparently, it must be very high because Keegan informs us that those things were selling like hotcakes and selling out. I would definitely do it. I mean, I don't have the most comfortable, like, you know, car to sit in for two and a half hours, but uh, just to do anything to get out of the house, I think it should be a, I think we talked about it, it should be a Travolta marathon, right? Saturday Night Fever, Grease, Pulp Fiction, I don't know, Face Off, That's name like any six other. Hours. Maybe, maybe Michael. Anyone remember Michael when he's the angel? Yeah. But if it was me, I'd, I think we should do Forrest Gump. I think it's got to be like the old school 60s, you know, horror movies or, you know, Godzilla, King Kong, you know, something that was made for outside, made for the campy, sit in your car, drink your soda in the wax cup with a lot of ice, let your kids run around the playgrounds, right? Have the popcorn. Kids come in their, you know, their uh, footy pajamas. I was That's thinking more... I was thinking more along the lines of, you know, a rom-com so you can do some passionate necking while you're in the car. <laughs> That's what you need. Uh, if I'm, Joe uh, shows up with a hickey next week on our video cam, uh, we're going to have to reveal it to our audience. I have no comment on that. I, I, have, a, I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old, so um, for me, there's absolutely no reason to go to a driving theater. Um, I, can, I can watch Despicable Me a hundred times at home. Thank you very much. That's, that's true. With that, we'll close. Thanks to our producer, Keegan St. Angemay, who will probably go to the drive-in. Join us next week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question, send us an email at podcast at trep.com. Until then... Visit TREP.com for more info and subscribe to the TREPWIRE podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right. <laughs> <laughs>